What's up guys, welcome back to this series on reinforcement learning. Last time we left our discussion of cue learning with the question of how an agent chooses to either explore the environment or to exploit it in order to select its actions. To answer this question, we'll introduce a type of strategy called an Epsilon Greedy strategy. So let's get to it. We're going to pick up right where we left off last time by continuing our explanation of cue learning with the lizard game example. Remember, in each episode, the agent, the lizard in our case, starts out by choosing an action from the starting state based on the current cue value estimates in the cue table. The lizard chooses its action based on the action with the highest cue value for the given state. Since we know that all of the cue values are first initialized to zero, there's no way for the lizard to differentiate between them at the starting state of the first episode. So the question remains, what action does the agent start with? Furthermore, for subsequent states, is it really as straightforward as just selecting the action with the highest cue value for the given state? Additionally, we know that we need a balance of exploration and exploitation to choose actions, but how exactly this is achieved is with an Epsilon Greedy strategy. So let's explore that strategy now. To get the balance between exploitation and exploration, we use what's called an Epsilon Greedy strategy. With this strategy, we define an exploration rate, Epsilon, that we initially set to 1. This exploration rate is the probability that our agent will explore the environment rather than exploit it. With epsilon equal to 1, it's 100% certain that the agent will start out by exploring the environment. As the agent learns more about the environment, at the start of each new episode, epsilon will decay by some rate that we set so that the likelihood of exploration becomes less and less probable as the agent learns more and more about the environment. The agent will become, in a sense, greedy in terms of exploiting the environment once it's had the opportunity to explore and learn more about it. To determine whether the agent will choose exploration or exploitation at each time step, we generate a random number between 0 and 1. If this number is greater than epsilon, then the agent will choose its next action via exploitation, i.e. it will choose the action with the highest Q value for its current state from the Q table. Otherwise, its next action will be chosen via exploration, i.e. randomly choosing its action and exploring what happens in the environment. So recall, we first started talking about the exploration-exploitation trade-off last time because we were discussing how the lizard should choose its very first action since all the actions have a Q value of 0 at the start. Well now, we should know that the action will be chosen randomly via exploration since the exploration rate is set to 1 initially meaning with 100% probability, the lizard will explore the environment during the first episode of the game rather than exploit it. All right, so after the lizard takes an action, it observes the next state, the reward gained from its action, and then updates the Q value in the Q table for the action it took from the previous state. Let's suppose the lizard chose to move right as its action from the starting state. We can see the reward the lizard gets in this new state is minus one since Recall, empty tiles have a reward of minus one point. To update the Q value for the action of moving right taken from the previous state, we use the Bellman equation that we highlighted previously. We want to make the Q value for the given state action pair as close as we can to the right hand side of the Bellman equation so that the Q value will eventually converge to the optimal Q value Q star. This will happen over time by iteratively comparing the loss between the Q value and the optimal Q value for the given state action pair, and then updating the Q value over and over again each time the agent encounters this same state action pair. And the objective of this process is to reduce the loss between the Q value and the optimal Q value. To actually see how we update the Q value, we first need to introduce the idea of a learning rate. The learning rate is a number between 0 and 1, which can be thought of as how quickly the agent abandons the previous Q value in the Q table for the new Q value for a given state action pair. So for example, suppose we have a Q value in the Q table for some arbitrary state action pair that the agent has experienced in a previous time step. Well, if the agent experiences that same state action pair at a later time step once it's learned more about the environment, 
the Q value will need to be updated to reflect the change in expectations the agent now has for the future return. We don't want to just overwrite the old Q value though, but rather we use the learning rate as a tool to determine how much information we keep about the previously computed Q value for the state action pair versus the new Q value calculated for the same state action pair just at a later time step. We'll denote the learning rate with the symbol alpha, and we'll arbitrarily set alpha equal to 0.7 for our lizard game example. The higher the learning rate, the more quickly the agent will adopt the new Q value. For example, if the learning rate is one, the estimate for the Q value for a given state action pair would be the straight up newly calculated Q value and wouldn't consider previous Q values that had previously been calculated for the given state action pair in earlier time steps. Now let's see how exactly the new Q value is calculated using the learning rate. Specifically, we'll see how the Q value is calculated for the example of the lizard taking the action of moving right from the starting state. The formula for calculating the new Q value for a state action pair S, A at time t is this. So our new Q value is equal to a weighted sum of our old value and the learned value. The old value in our case is zero, since this is the first time the agent is experiencing this particular state action pair. And we multiply this old value by one minus alpha. Our learned value is the reward we receive from moving right from the starting state, plus the discounted estimate of the optimal future Q value for the next state action pair, S prime comma A prime at time T plus one. This entire learned value is then multiplied by our learning rate. All of the math for this calculation of our concrete example state action pair is shown here. So take a moment to pause and make sure you've got everything down. All right, so now we'll take this new Q value we just calculated and store it in our Q table for this particular state action pair. We've now done everything needed for a single time step. This same process will happen for each time step until termination in each episode. Oh, and speaking of termination, we can also specify a max number of steps that our agent can take before the episode auto terminates. With the way the game's set up right now, termination will only occur if the lizard reaches the state with five crickets or the state with the bird. We could define some condition though that states if the lizard hasn't reached termination by either one of these two states after 100 steps, then terminate the game after the 100th step. Now, finally, once the Q function converges to the optimal Q function, we can obtain our optimal policy. All right, now I know all of that was kind of a lot, so I've provided really condensed summarized steps for everything we covered in the last video and this video for how Q learning works. It's available on the corresponding blog for this video, along with all the full details for everything we've covered so far. So check that out and be sure you're taking advantage of that resource. In the next video, we're going to see how we can implement this Q-learning algorithm step-by-step -step in code using Python to play a simple game. We'll have lots more to talk about there. Let me know in the comments if you're stoked to actually start getting your hands dirty to implement some of this stuff. And be sure to leave a thumbs up if you are. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence, and I'll see you in the next one. Artificial intelligence will change our world. Machines that can think like humans, yet crunch through massive amounts of data in a very inhuman way, may be exactly the tool we need to solve our biggest problems. AI may also unlock the remaining mysteries of the human mind, and this is what intrigues me the most. I'm not a neuroscientist, but as a computer scientist, I write programs that can learn, learn from their experience, and change and adapt. As for the environment, we mainly use games at DeepMind. Why is that? Well, games are very, very useful because we can readily evaluate how well the agent does by pitting it against a human player, for example, or comparing its score to other agents. But more importantly, we can think of games as being uh, like a microcosm of human ability because they are so diverse and so ubiquitous across human culture. So they're incredibly valuable if what we want is to both develop and demonstrate artificial intelligence.